The vast majority of radical reactions require the generation of a radical in the initiation stage from a species with a weak bond. That weak bond can break homolytically relatively easily, often in the inf under the influence of ultraviolet light, visible light, or heat, and this gets the propagation cycle going after that propagating radical is generated. This slide just surveys some important radical initiators that we'll see in radical reactions. We've already seen chlorine and bromine acting in this role in the presence of ultraviolet light. These bonds can cleave homolytically to create chlorine or bromine atoms. Acyl peroxides are a commonly used radical initiator. They have a weak OO bond here between two uh, kind of separate ester groups, if you like, two carboxyl groups linked to each other. That weak OO bond can cleave homolytically to create these carboxyl radicals. And you want to be careful with peroxides. Acyl peroxides, not so bad, but alkyl peroxides can be highly explosive. These can form in old solutions of ethers, for example, and that can make those old ether, um, old ether bottles highly dangerous. One that we often use in practical organic chemistry is this compound, AIBN. AIBN has a central NN group that can actually form N2 gas upon homolytic cleavage of the carbon-nitrogen bonds on either side of that central NN double bond linkage. So under the influence of heat, electron flow like this generates N2 and these carbon radicals, which are resonance stabilized radicals, and these can kick off uh, radical reactions. So AIBN is commonly used as a radical initiator. And in initiation, often these radicals will do something else to generate sort of the key carbon radical. So for example, AIBN might abstract a hydrogen or something like that to kick off propagation. In biological contexts, free radicals can be undesirable because they can cause damage to tissues and aging and so on and so forth. So you've probably heard of radical inhibitors or antioxidants which are directed against the reactivity of free radicals. These convert relatively reactive radicals into less reactive radicals or even, even electron species so that they become not dangerous. Dioxygen, O2 is unquestionably the most important radical inhibitor, both in the laboratory and in biochemistry. O2 can shut down radical reactions in the laboratory that we want to occur, and so quite frequently the exclusion of oxygen causes an improvement in the outcome of radical reactions in the laboratory. And the basic idea here is that O2 has two unpaired electrons in it, right? If we think a little bit deeply about the structure of the O2 molecule. And so one of those can couple with a free radical. If it's around, we can make a peroxy radical, we could make a peroxide with two OR groups linked to each other, and those decay by relatively innocuous pathways um, so that we eliminate the potential inherent danger or, or reactivity in this free radical. And again, this is sometimes undesirable in the laboratory. If we want this radical, for example, it's a carbon radical, and we want it to be halogenated, this is going to prevent halogenation and convert that R group into something else. An example with biochemical relevance is hydroquinone. This molecule provides H's that can be abstracted to produce a resonance stabilized radical and two abstraction events converts the reduced hydroquinone, this starting structure, to the oxidized benzoquinone like so. So this actually provides two hydrogen atoms that can be used to consume potentially dangerous free radicals in biochemical systems in living organisms. Jumping back to halogenation now, we can ask this question about other halogens with CH4. We've seen chlorination works just fine. What about fluorination, bromination, and iodination? We can see as we go down this series that the reaction gets more endothermic, less thermodynamically favorable as we go from F2 to I2. And the reaction with F2 is extremely exothermic. And this is downright unsafe, so it's not generally done in practice to make alkyl fluorides. Chlorination works great, but as we'll see in a bit, it's unselective for higher alkanes, so it's generally not used beyond methane. Br2 is ideal, still an exothermic reaction, highly selective, not as rapid as chlorination, but we can live with that. And iodination is actually thermodynamically forbidden.
because the free energy change of the reaction is greater than zero. And so this is a non-spontaneous reaction. Nature wants it to live at I2 and methane, and so no formation or very little formation of methyl iodide and HI is observed in this reaction. Generally, nine times out of 10, with higher alkanes than methane, we're gonna use bromination as the reaction of choice here to install a halogen on an alkane selectively. The key difference between bromination and chlorination is really in this first propagation step, the hydrogen abstraction by the halogen atom to produce a carbon radical. This is endothermic in bromination, but exothermic in chlorination. We can actually use the HX bond energies compared to the CX bond energy to, to rationalize this. This is the kind of thing, if you pause and go look up bond energies, it's very easy to do these calculations. When you do, you, f you find that the, bromine, the step with bromine is endothermic. This makes it slow, however, it also makes it more selective, as we'll see on the next slide. These reaction coordinate diagrams just underscore the point that in chlorination, this first hydrogen abstraction step by the halogen atom is exothermic, while in bromination, this step is endothermic. And the origin of the higher selectivity of bromination has to do with this endothermic first step. The transition state energy here is closer in energy to the product. So this is a product-like transition state, and the product is the carbon radical. The key product that's driving the energy right here is the carbon radical. And so the transition state is radical-like. Effects on the stability of the radical are gonna be felt in the transition state. We're gonna to return to this in a second after we talk about bromination in a little more detail. Alkanes that are bigger than methane have distinct CH bonds that could be abstracted to produce different carbon radicals and different alkyl halide products. For example, propane, the three carbon propane, has a secondary carbon and a primary carbon that could lead to a secondary alkyl halide or a primary alkyl halide. So abstraction at the secondary position leads to two halopropane, uh, abstraction at the primary position leads to one halo propane, right? And so we could get, and so we have a sort of a regiochemical issue here, an issue of site selectivity. The outcome in any given halogenation reaction is actually a mixture of pure statistics and the intrinsic selectivity of the reaction based on, for example, radical stability. Pure statistics comes into play because for entropic reasons, for reasons of entropy, the more H's I have linked to a particular type of carbon, the more likely it is on pure statistics to abstract that hydrogen and generate the product derived from that abstraction. So things like CH3 groups having more hydrogens actually causes them to some extent to generate more of the um, product derived from abstraction of a hydrogen at the methyl group. Now, intrinsic selectivity of the reaction based on radical stability can override the statistical preference. But in chlorination, it often does not. So for example, here, if we hit propane with chlorine and light, we do get a little bit more of the secondary alkyl chloride derived from the more stable secondary radical. But we get a large amount of the primary alkyl chloride as well via the primary radical the selectivity is not great, and the, the low selectivity is due to this statistical issue. I've got six methyl hydrogens and only two secondary hydrogens, and, and this creates a statistical bias for the primary alkyl chloride. However, bromination is much, much more selective. If we run the same reaction with Br2 instead of Cl2, we get 97% the secondary alkyl bromide product via the more stable secondary radical. So bromination is much more highly selective. And again, for, for higher alkanes than methane, we're always going to use Br2 and light just to ensure we get the highest yield of product possible and avoid separation issues between these isomeric alkyl bromides. Finally, now we're going to explain the origin of this greater selectivity of bromination as opposed to chlorination. So we noted earlier that hydrogen abstraction, that first step of propagation, is exothermic for chlorination but endothermic for bromination. And although this slows down the rate of bromination because this step is endothermic, this enhances the selectivity. So notice the separation between these transition state energies in the bromination reaction, much greater than that separation in the chlorination reaction. The basis of this can be explained by the Hammond postulate. 
the transition state in bromination is product-like and in chlorination is reactant-like. So the transition state in chlorination doesn't have a good sense that, hey, I'm going to a radical on the product side. So differences in stabilities of the product radicals actually don't have a big impact on the transition state energies for this reactant-like transition state. The transition state is, is much more looking, looking much more like the alkane as opposed to the radicals. On the, on the flip side, with endothermic hydrogen abstraction, the transition state looks much more like the radicals. So these differences in stabilities of the primary, secondary, and tertiary radicals are felt profoundly in these transition states, which are product-like. So this leads to much greater selectivity in brominations due to the separation in energy between these transition state energies. And it's all about the Hammond postulate in action here. So long story short, bromination is much more regioselective than uh, chlorination, and we're going to use bromination in all of our halogenations of alkanes other than methane. Here's another example that makes this difference between chlorination and bromination even more stark. When I take this compound, terbutane, and hit it with Cl2, I, the major product is actually the primary alkyl chloride. This is because there are nine methyl CHs in this compound. Pause the video and draw in those implied hydrogens on these three methyl groups. Nine methyl hydrogens. So statistics and entropy are arguing we're going to chlorinate at the more abundant position, the methyl CH. And so the major product is the product derived from, methyl, uh, from a chlorination at one of the methyl carbons. If we use bromine, completely different outcome. We see no bromination at the methyl carbon and entirely bromination at the tertiary position. And this is driven by radical stability, right? Bromination at the tertiary carbon occurs via a tertiary carbon radical, which is much, much more stable than a primary carbon radical. And that stability difference is felt when we use bromine because, again, of that endothermic hydrogen abstraction step, the first step of propagation. In this problem, we're asked to predict the major product when this alkane is treated with Br2 and light. And we know bromine is highly selective for the most substituted CH bond via the most stable uh, carbon radical with the most substituents. So here it's going to be helpful first to kind of break down the alkane and look for the most substituted CH bond. And so what I'm going to do is highlight the primary, secondary, and tertiary carbons in this compound so that we can find the tertiary carbon where the most stable CH bond is located. So we have these methyl groups. We can think of those carbons as primary. They've got CH3Hs and unstable radicals are going to form at these positions. So these will not be where halogenation occurs. These secondary carbons also will not be the favored positions of halogenation, assuming we can find a tertiary carbon in here. And in fact, there is a tertiary carbon. It's located right here, and there's the tertiary CH bond. We're going to abstract that hydrogen in the midst of this halogenation reaction with Br2. There's one more carbon in this alkane, and it's this carbon here, which has no hydrogens connected to it. It's quaternary, so it cannot get involved in halogenation with no H to abstract. So in the first step of propagation, we're going to take a bromine radical that's generated during initiation, right, homolytic cleavage of the Br2 bond, and abstract that hydrogen to generate a carbon radical. This carbon radical is going to react with Br2 in a halogen abstraction step to generate the product. So overall, we get the alkyl halide corresponding to substitution of this H for a bromine. And the byproduct here, which is worth noting, is HBr. That was generated in the first step of propagation, the hydrogen abstraction by bromine from the alkane. So key here was recognizing the tertiary CH bond. This is going to lead to a relatively stable tertiary radical, much more stable than all the other possible radicals. And thanks to the use of bromine, we're under highly regioselective reaction conditions. And the major product by far will be this one with bromine at the most substituted position. Finally, I want to say a few words about the stereochemistry of alkane halogenations. The starting alkane may contain a stereocenter, and stereocenters are, are quite frequently highly substituted. So these are often the positions where halogenation takes place. And so we might either generate or modify a stereocenter in the course of an alkane halogenation reaction. 
case one here is the situation where we go from an achiral alkane to a chiral product. And as we've seen previously, this is going to involve the generation of a racemic mixture of the two possible enantiomers. So here, for example, these two alkyl bromides are enantiomers of each other. They're going to be generated in equal amounts. We're going to get a racemic mixture there. And this reaction goes via a planar achiral carbon radical. So that planar radical can be approached by Br2 from above or below. That will happen to equal degrees or equal amounts. And we get a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers. When the reactive carbon is a stereocenter, as in this alkane, we actually still get a racemic mixture of enantiomers because the reaction, again, goes through a planar achiral carbon radical. So after hydrogen abstraction here from this position, abstraction of a hydrogen there is going to flatten out that stereocenter, destroy the stereochemistry, stereoablative, if you want uh, the fancy term that people use nowadays. And that achiral carbon radical can be approached by Br2 from above or below, and it will um, be approached with equal probability from either side. And so we get a racemic mixture of these two enantiomeric alkyl bromides. This is when that reactive carbon, the carbon where the hydrogen abstraction occurs, is a stereocenter. When the reactant contains an unreactive stereocenter, we get an unequal mixture of diastereomers. So in this example, we've got two stereocenters in the product, one right here, uh, in the reactant rather, one right here and one right here. Reaction is going to occur at this tertiary position, and that will go through a carbon radical that is flat at the radical center but has this stereocenter on the other side of the molecule. So we get a mixture of these two products with the two different configurations where reaction occurred, but the same configuration at this methoxy bearing stereocenter. So these two compounds are related as diastereomers. Because they are diastereomers, we're going to get an equal mixture, unequal mixture, unequal mixture of the two. And this is known as a scalemic mixture, kind of an analogous term to racemic. It's an unequal mixture of stereoisomers, a scalemic mixture. Now, the next question this will lead you to, if, if you think this through further, is which of the two diastereomers is more favored? What's the major product? We're not generally going to make this prediction in Organic Chemistry 1, because this involves subtle considerations of sterics and other factors that we don't need to worry about so much. The most important thing is we expect an unequal mixture of the two diastereomers, and you definitely want to be able to draw the structures of both diastereomers when predicting products of these reactions.